Coming up on Market to Market, President Obama sidesteps Congress to reform immigration policy on his own. A lame duck Senate puts up yet another roadblock for the Keystone XL pipeline. And we'll visit a contest where competitors don husking hooks for a battle of the bang boards. It's tough, makes me appreciate modern farm machinery. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, November 21 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. America's attention turned to the thorny issue of immigration this week, an issue that has dogged the White House for decades. The last major overhaul happened in 1986, when President Reagan signed sweeping immigration reforms into law. Reagan tightened security at the Mexican border and implemented harsh penalties for employers who hired undocumented workers. But in a provision not typically associated with the father of modern conservatism, the law also offered amnesty to immigrants who entered the country prior to 1982. Presidents of both the Democratic and Republican persuasion have tried, and largely failed, to reform U.S. immigration policy numerous times since Reagan. And the latest chapter of the story was penned Thursday night, when Barack Obama flexed his presidential muscle by issuing a controversial executive order. Ignoring furious Republicans, President Obama issued an executive order on immigration Thursday night, sparing nearly 5 million undocumented immigrants from deportation and focusing enforcement efforts on felons instead of families. Es un día histórico. The move represents the most sweeping changes to U.S. immigration policy in nearly three decades, and it sets up a high-stakes fight with Republicans over the limits of presidential power. In an address to the nation, Obama defended the legality of his actions and challenged GOP lawmakers to focus their energy not on blocking his efforts, but on approving long-stalled legislation in Congress. And to those members of Congress who question my authority to make our immigration system work better, or question the wisdom of me acting where Congress has failed, I have one answer. Pass a bill. Despite Obama's challenge to Republicans to pass a broader immigration bill, his latest action could diminish those prospects for the remainder of his presidency. With this action, the president has chosen to deliberately sabotage any chance of enacting bipartisan reforms that he claims to seek. Obama also announced new deportation guidelines that would require law enforcement officials to focus their efforts on tracking down serious criminals and people who crossed the border recently, while placing a lower priority on those who have been in the U.S. for more than 10 years. Despite the president's lofty goals, the executive order still leaves more than half the estimated 11 million people living in the U.S. illegally in limbo. But he insisted that his actions do not amount to amnesty. Amnesty is the immigration system we have today. Millions of people who live here without paying their taxes or playing by the rules, while politicians use the issue to scare people and whip up votes at election time. Republicans, who characterized the president's executive order as an unconstitutional power grab, are considering several responses. But GOP leaders hope to avoid spending bill tactics that could lead to another government shutdown. I think the president will come to regret the chapter history writes if he does move forward. The failure of lawmakers to approve reforms places President Obama between the rock of Republicans angered by his tactics on immigration and the hard place of Latinos who've played a major role in recent elections. The administration faces decisions on other matters, however, that could force him off the fence. But maybe not right away. On Friday, the EPA announced it will not decide how much ethanol and other biofuels must be included in U.S. gas tanks until at least the new year. But in the days ahead, the president will likely be forced to make a decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. This week, though, 
Before adjourning for Thanksgiving, Senate lawmakers spared him from having to make a decision. Having not been achieved, the bill is not passed. Falling just one vote shy of Senate approval, the Keystone XL pipeline, a political hot potato for nearly six years, was punted by lawmakers again this week. On the table. Late last week, the Republican-led House of Representatives voted in favor of the proposal that would transport Canadian oil sands bitumen to Gulf Coast refineries. <laughs> Following a midterm electoral rout by the GOP, proponents were hopeful a lame duck Congress would take a cue from voters and make this the ninth time the House has passed a bill on Keystone XL, to the, the charm. This infrastructure is absolutely essential to the economic power of the United States of America. But another lukewarm reception in the Senate Tuesday thwarted legislative attempts to circumvent presidential authority. If we want to protect our planet from devastating climate change, the vote is no on the Keystone XL pipeline, which I call extra lethal. Because it would cross an international border, jurisdiction over the $8 billion pipeline falls to the State Department and ultimately President Obama. It is about energy, it is about jobs, it is about economic growth, and it is about national security by building a secure energy future for this country. Republican leaders vowed a return to the issue in early 2015, when the party assumes control of both houses of Congress, setting the stage for a showdown with the Oval Office. The Obama administration has stated its latest intention to weigh a pending verdict in Nebraska before moving forward. In the state of Nebraska, every single person will be saying no. The Cornhusker state has become the epicenter of contentious debate over the controversial project. The original route would have run through the state's ecologically sensitive Sand Hills region and across a broad portion of the Ogallala Aquifer a crucial supply of irrigation and drinking water for Nebraska and a handful of other states. We're calling in the harvest of hope to the president to say, you told us to be the change, to be the citizens that tried to make a difference. We're making the difference and we expect you, not we hope, we expect you to stand with us. After revising the route, Calgary, Alberta-based TransCanada Corporation won endorsement from outgoing Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman in early 2013. But early this year, a Nebraska State District Court ruled a hastily constructed law which gave the governor authority to approve the project ran afoul of the state's constitution. Despite suggestions that plummeting oil prices could quash the economic viability of Keystone XL, TransCanada is expected to keep a watchful eye on GOP efforts in 2015. The Agriculture Department predicts U.S. net farm income will decline nearly 15% in 2014 to a four-year low of $113.2 billion. And as folks in the heartland know all too well, it doesn't take long for the impact of slumping commodity prices to ripple through the broader rural economy. In August, Deer & Company forecast equipment sales to fall about 8% in the fourth quarter and route to a 6% decline this year. While global economics also factor into the equation, the company has cut back production and laid off more than 1,000 U.S. employees in response to the downturn. But it's not as if farmers will ignore their need for mechanization by harnessing a team of horses or shelling corn by hand. Still, some people actually wish they would. Market to Market visited one of their events a few weeks ago and discovered the art of harvesting by hand. Paul Yeager explains. In a scene resembling a Norman Rockwell painting, people from all over the country gathered in Iowa this fall for a competition rooted in hard work. Honors were bestowed on the best competitors, but the real prize was awarded to everyone as spectators witnessed a chore from the past that helped shape the legacy of the American farm. Corn husking contests began in the 1920s. Agricultural pioneer Henry Wallace was concerned that the strong work ethic was eroding from Midwestern life. So he invited farmers to a field near Alleman, Iowa, to see who could husk the most corn in a single day. 
That inaugural competition attracted only three contestants, but the event quickly grew in popularity. By the end of the decade, corn husking was a burgeoning national sport with no less than nine states hosting competitions. Interest in the events grew steadily through the 1930s, and by the 40s, crowds numbering in the tens of thousands were on hand for the Super Bowl of corn husking contests, simply called the National. In 1940, Davenport, Iowa attracted the largest crowd for the corn husking National. 116,000 spectators, nearly twice the population of Davenport itself, gathered to watch Irvin Bauman of Illinois pick 46.6 bushels, almost two tons, to win the coveted prize. With the onset of World War II, corn husking contests came to an abrupt end. And by the time the weary troops returned, Rural America was in the throes of dramatic change. The same industrial buildup that enabled the Allies to defeat the axis of evil was making its presence known down on the farm. The result? Farmers did more work with fewer people. America shifted from an agrarian society to one forged by industry, and millions of people pulled up roots and moved to densely populated urban cities in a mass exodus from the heartland. Hoping to preserve the history of harvesting corn by hand, Dave Vandenboom brought the contest back to Iowa in 2011. And to remain true to the competition's heritage, the only other laborers in the field were draft horses. Years and years ago, that's how corn husking began, was you had corn in the field, you needed to pick it. It was done by hand. It wasn't done by a $300,000 combine. It was done by hand and a team of horses or mules. In October, the rolling hills near Iowa's historic Amana colonies hosted the National Corn Husking Championships. And 5,000 fans gathered to watch 140 competitors, the most in the history of the contest, tried their hand with the husking hook. For some, it was a trip down memory lane. Others marveled at the labor-intensive method of harvesting, and some were just plain curious how such an event held a century ago drew thousands to the fields. While the objective is simple, to compete at the national level is not easy. Contestants try to husk the most corn during a specific amount of time, typically ranging anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. In Corn Husking's heyday, however, the National lasted 80 minutes, and there were no breaks. Trailing behind the husker is the gleaner, who picks up corn missed or dropped by the competitor. For every pound of gleanings recovered, three pounds of corn is deducted from the total weight. The harvested corn is judged for cleanness and uniformity. Deductions are imposed for excess husks. We weigh out 20 pounds of corn, and anything that has shucks left on it, we, that's a deduction from their score, because, you know, when they were doing this by hand, any, any corn shucks you had took up, took up space in the, in, the, in the corn bin. And when the dust finally settled, Frank Hennefant of Illinois emerged as the 2014 National Corn Husking Champion. Not to be outdone, however, Market to Market's very own Mike Pearson donned the husking glove in the celebrity division. It's tough. Makes me appreciate modern farm machinery, <laughs> for sure. Surprisingly fun. For the work that's required, it's surprisingly fun. Well, yeah, 77 minus your barrel weight. So oh, much, much. that's <laughs> what, five or eight? 17. 17 pounds? Yes. So I was 50 pounds? <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out. And appreciate your help, guys. This is educational. Mr. Pearson, who's with Market to Market, you can call him Mike if you want to, but you can. You know, Appreciate it. Thank uh, you. We, uh, we appreciate Mike coming out. Next, the Market to Market report. Weak foreign demand, another delay in the decision on the renewable fuel standard, and a stronger dollar pressured grain prices this week. For the week, December wheat shed 13 cents, while the nearby corn contract fell nearly a dime. 
Continued drought in South America pushed soybeans higher as the nearby contract rallied by 17 cents. Nearby meal prices, however, lost ground by $1.50 per ton. In the softs, cotton moved sideways as the December contract fell 4 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy market, December Class 3 milk lost 4 cents, while the deferred contract declined by 21 cents. Some livestock continued gains, albeit smaller, as the December cattle contract gained 70 cents. Nearby feeders advanced by nearly a quarter. However, the December lean hog contract shed just over $2. In the financials, the euro lost one basis point against the dollar. Crude oil snapped a seven-week straight slide as the December contract settled with a gain of nearly 70 cents per barrel. Comex Gold rallied by $12 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index rallied by more than two points to settle at 524.80. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Let's get right into this wheat market. We have definitely been on a, uh, a bit of a seesaw with prices there. Can you talk to us a little bit about where we are today in the market? Yeah, and I tell you, the uh, wheat market is much like the rest of the grains. We've kind of pushed up to some big levels, and exactly like you said, really the last three weeks we've just been treading water. Uh, nearby wheat's really been in a range 560 to 590. Part of the issue is when you push up to the top end of that range, we become uncompetitive. The rest of the world takes our market share, and then we push back down to the lower end of the range to buy, uh, buy demand back again. So meantime, uh, feed wheat's being shipped into the United States, so that's a, a, a negative. It is a negative. Now, as we talk about this range that the market's been trading in, uh, should we expect that range to continue to shrink lower as the dollar continues to strengthen? Well, you know, a lot of it's about our export pace. Our export pace so far is down 26% for the year. So, you know, we're really struggling from that standpoint. So I think really probably a well-priced wheat market uh, nearby is probably really in that, not that far off from where we are, probably that 520 to 540 range, uh, you know, on the downside. You know, the upside is really going to struggle when we get close to that 580 to the $6 mark. So, you know, I think we're kind of caught in a range and uh, more of the same, I think, to come unless some other issues develop. Now, speaking of other issues, most of wheat growing country has been gripped here by this recent cold snap. Is that having any indication on the quality of uh, winter wheat that's been sown already this year? Well, you know, we're not going to find out for a, for a number of months. When it breaks dormancy, we'll get a better idea. But, you know, that is going to be an issue, and I think that did give us a little bit of support, uh, you know, because we do have a tight situation uh, in the U.S. and around the world, really, on the high-protein wheat. It's the uh, feed wheat that really has the excess supply. All right. Well, now let's jump down into the corn market. And to start us off on the corn discussion today, Phil in Ontario, Canada, who's one of our followers on Twitter, uh, he's got a question for you. He asks, with the USDA reducing the corn yield in the November report, is it a clue that yield was overestimated this year? What's the market's thoughts on what, we, what did we actually grow? Well, that's a good question because usually big crops get bigger and in this report it didn't. It got a little bit smaller, but don't be surprised if we have uh, the yield grows back a little bit. Uh, but, you know, probably the other issue you have to be concerned about in the January report, do we see the uh, acres adjusted lower? So that's a possibility. But, uh, you know, I would say right now, regardless, a little bit smaller yield, we still have a big carryout and we still have an abundance uh, supply. And on the supply side, we know we're sitting on a pile of corn. On the demand side, I noticed this week that uh, the weekly corn grind for ethanol was, was back up to chewing up a fair amount of corn. Um, on the demand side, how does the picture look? Well, you know, on the demand side, you're right. The ethanol uh, demand is strong, you know, and it's uh, just, but even with the strong demand that we have on ethanol, we're really just on pace to meet the uh, goal that the USDA said. Our export pace is another story. You know, we're uh, slow. We're 14% uh, under a year ago. You know, one of the issues, like I say, we're sending the wrong signal. We're importing some uh, feed wheat. Uh, from uh, from France, from the UK, you know, and that's not what we need to do at the present time. So, you know, the corn market has pushed up really to the top end of this range on tight farmer selling, but we've pushed up here now where we're starting to see some structural uh, damage with uh, import of some of the wheat, but we're just at some resistance area again on corn, Mike. Now, and so that leads us right into pricing. We had so many producers go ahead and slam the bin door shut. They've got the corn socked away. Uh, how do you market? what you've stored thus far? 
Well, the one thing you really have to watch once, uh, uh, you know, the market, uh, the grain is tucked away, you have to really start to watch the basis levels because that's the first area that you're going to uh, move grain away from the uh, market, from the uh, producer and from the uh, supply, from the uh, chain of the marketplace. Uh, and so I think what we've seen this last week is we have seen the basis levels tighten up a bit. We've seen some uh, pickup in movement. And uh, you know, just enough. It's a market when you have a, a big supply. It doesn't take a lot of movement. You just kind of stall out. Okay, and that's where we're at today. Yeah, and really, what the corn market's done is we're putting in a, a head and shoulders top, basically, because we pushed up, you know, from the tight producer uh, uh, holding. We pushed up to these uh, the 390, uh, 80 level on the uh, December corn, but we've just struggled between 365, 375 on the uh, December corn. If we break under 362, we'll break that neckline, and you know we could come under some pressure. But you know, really, it's just a market that we're trying to sort through and uh, see if we can get out of the range for right now. All right, it is nice to see this rally from what we've seen there first of October. It's nice to have a turnaround. Oh, it most, it, it most definitely is, but we don't have enough positive uh, demand, uh, you know, to push up to some new levels, so we're just struggling. You have to be careful with the funds sitting with a, a huge long position, about two, around 200,000 contracts versus short 150,000 last year. You really have the producer a big long, you have the funds a big long, and so you really do need a positive catalyst to push out of this level. Right. We don't want to see all those folks selling at once. That's the risk. You know, if we move into next year, producer movement picks up. A South America crop uh, is okay. You know, we you know could have some issues to the downside. All right. Now, speaking of South America, we did see a little rally on soybeans this week. Was that primarily related to weather in South America, or is it still tied to the soy meal demand on the East Coast? I think it's primarily the uh, soybean meal, but we're starting to see the soybean meal, uh, you know, crack just a little bit from a demand standpoint. But, you know, like you alluded to, Mike, really what we've had is just a very difficult transition from razor tight, record tight supplies on soybeans and soybean meal, uh, you know, from last year to this year. We've got an abundance of uh, soybeans. Crush margins are huge, around 250 a bushel. So it's just a matter of time. We had a record crush uh, the last month. And, uh, you know, at some point in time, we'll start to see that situation change. And you have to be careful that we don't run into a supply problem on the other side once we get over this very tight transition time frame. Probably an opportunity to meter out some sales if you're holding some beans at this point. Well, there again, the basis levels in, in some areas have pushed up to areas from a cash standpoint that they warrant the sales. You know, that's exactly right. From a flat price standpoint, uh, you know, you're, you, we probably have, are, are past our fundamental objectives to the upside. But it's really been the technicals that have been driving the market. Again, the funds have pushed, pushed into the soybean market uh, along about 40,000 contracts. We're short, you know, in a big way in October. So, you know, we've just had a rebalancing and uh, very similar to the corn, you know, all is good until we get into next year. We see some cash movement if South America uh, doesn't have a problem. You know, the funds sell, you know, then we have some issues to the downside again. You bet. Well, now let's jump over to the livestock market. On the fat cattle side, cash trade relatively steady this week. Where was it trading? Yeah, it was. I mean, cash cattle for the most part traded pretty much the same with last week, 172. Um, you know, up at these uh, lofty levels, all-time records, of course. The futures market this week made all-time highs. So, um, but if you look at it from a seasonal standpoint, a typical seasonal gain from the uh, third quarter to the fourth quarter pushes your cash cattle market up to 173. So when you're at 172, you have to be careful, you know, that we're not getting towards the upper end of the range. Right. How, uh, how much do you want to hold on to for that extra dollar? Well, exactly. You know, really the tight supplies, but we're in a futures market, is going to be the first quarter of next year. Our supplies are going to be down 5% versus this last year. Then when you get in the second quarter, they're the same. The third quarter, we're down about 2.8%. But for the year, we're going to be down 3.2%. So what's that mean from a price standpoint? We think it's kind of similar to 2000, uh, last year, 2014 when we uh, peaked out the, in uh, February at 153. All right. And now we did see the cattle on feed report. Nothing huge in that today, if, if I'm aware. It was uh, relatively steady and fairly yeah. in line with expectations. Yeah, there again, you know, the cattle on feed report, a little bit historical, you know, because they're basically almost a month old, but no real big surprises. Really, the driver on this market is going to be demand. And, uh, you know, does the packer pay up, uh, you know, for, for cattle in this area in a tight supply situation? Now, speaking of demand, there's tremendous demand out there for feeder calves. Uh, what does this market look like heading into November, Thanksgiving, and into December? 
Well, you're right. I mean, the feeder cattle market is just tight. It's going to stay tight. It's really a matter of, uh, you know, if the, if the corn market breaks, uh, breaks back again, uh, does the feeder cattle uh, demand stay strong? But there again, I think it's a lot of what happens with the break-evens on cattle. When you have uh, break-evens, you know, 160, 168 on some of these cattle, um, you've got to be very careful. Feeder cattle are probably at the upper end of the range. You're really waiting for the feeders and fat cattle for some kind of a blow-off top. We've had a couple mini blow-offs but that's what you'll really are looking for in the market. All right. Now let's jump down to the uh, the lean hog market. December lean hogs down $2 this week. People selling off in light of there not being much PED or what happened? Well, I think the one thing is on the hog market, we're still in a supply bear market, but uh, it, we, there is, we're in a transition. We had the... Uh, tighter supplies last year from the PED virus. We're trying to move into bigger supplies as we go forward, and that's happening. Um, you know, in this fourth quarter, you know, we could be unchanged up slightly on our total overall uh, production. Weights remain large. In the first quarter next year, Mike, for example, we go up 1% on hog production. Second quarter, you go up 3%. And in the uh, third quarter, you go up uh, 7%. For the year, you go up 4%. So we're on the march higher. So when you get June hogs approaching this $100 mark, you know, there's a lot of resistance on the uh, hogs up at it's that hard. area. It's, just, it's hard to imagine how much meat will be available if we're still feeding hogs to the weight we are today with a 4% increase. Well, that's exactly right. And if you look at all the proteins, red meat and poultry combined, next year we're going to be up 1.6% on uh, versus this last year on total meat. So, uh, you know, we are moving higher. It's just a matter of uh, the cattle remain the, uh, the bull story. All right. Well, Don, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market, but we will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we visit a group of refugee farmers learning the business of agriculture. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.